Hi, I'm Fraser from Checks, where we're building the trusted data economy. But today, we're going to be talking about the difference between NFTs, SBTs, and VCs. And really, let's start with the acronyms. So really, non-fungible tokens, Solbon tokens, and then verifiable credentials. Um, but firstly, who am I? So I'm Fraser, uh, CEO of Checked. Um, if you want to get in touch, all the links are on the left and right hand side, whether it's me personally or Checked as a company. Um, but let's get on to what we're actually wanting to be covering today. So um, what we will be covering, so definitions of NFTs, Solbon tokens, verifiable credentials, looking really, really briefly at the similarities because there aren't many of them, then going into kind of the differences and more interestingly, going into kind of a flow chart of how we can decide where we would go and use these, if any. Um, and then looking at very, very specific examples, which start to tease out some of the differences and the nuances of, of where you might use one over the other. And things that we won't be covering. Um, so technical details of any of these, we really won't be going into kind of the standards that sit behind these, the technical specifications, the libraries, the languages, all that kind of thing. Um, we won't be talking about the kind of the validity of NFTs or SoBound tokens for on ledger on ledger asset representation. So we're kind of taking a bit of an assumption there. And then we're also not talking about the, the adoption of each of these either. So we're not really looking at kind of the adoption trends, especially as the kind of markets are wavering across all of these. But probably the best place to start is is kind of definitions like we're, like we've said on the left hand side. So the easiest one of these to start off with is, is NFTs. Um, and probably the best place to start really is, is kind of this definition here. So um, really the, the idea here is to, uh, or the idea behind NFTs was to respond to a need for on-ledger representation of non-fungible assets. So a fungible asset here would be something like, well, money. Um, it's endlessly divisible to a certain point um, and any kind of uh, within a currency um, one dollar looks like the next one pound looks like the next and they're kind of end endlessly exchangeable um, non-fungible obviously is, is kind of the complete opposite of that so we're looking into things like physical property uh, virtual collectibles um, and kind of things into IP rights maybe and obviously there's there's then a debate which we'll come back to kind of later on around like physical property and fractionalized ownership. Um, for example, a lot of my friends own houses either with a partner or with a friend who they bought with. Um, so therefore, you've got this idea already of fractionalized ownership of something that's theoretically non-fungible. Um, so that's that's kind of NFTs very much responding to a need for, again, that on ledger representation of non fungible assets. And like I was saying at the front, um, it, we're not going to dive into whether that's kind of a valid thing to be doing or not. It's effectively what it was kind of responding to. Solbar tokens, on, on the other hand, were kind of um, an evolution of, of kind of NFTs. Um, and that's where we really come onto the paper authored by or co authored by. Uh, kind of Vitalik, but also Glenn Whale and, and Pooja uh, Oliver. Um, and I've, I'm pretty sure I've butchered their names there. Um, but if we kind of look down to the outline, really, um, Solban tokens were almost a, a response to the fact that non-fungible tokens were being used to start representing identity. Um, and identity here is kind of broadly kind of um, and using the words that are in the SVT document, kind of commitments, credentials, and affiliations, um, all typically like surrounding an individual. And the the SVT paper was very much focused on kind of the idea of decentralized society. Um, so the potential to kind of um, organize without central authorities, traditionally governments, um, and to collaborate online with a level of trust um, that, that's currently absent so far. And obviously a lot of people talk about the identity layer of, of the internet being missing, but realistically a lot of that could, you, could just be replaced by trust. You don't necessarily need to know the identity on the other side. What you need to know is whether you can trust them and whether they have a good reputation or not. So if, if we look at Soulbound tokens specifically, um, we're kind of looking at the ability to have those, again, those commitments, those credentials, those affiliations. So affiliations here may be something like the membership of a DAO, 
um, or just kind of affiliations between kind of loose groups of people or just even between each other. Um, commitments, there's a lot of talk in here about kind of loans, the ability to have uh, kind of Bit like kind of on ledger behavior here, um, but also kind of the more general thing is, is credentials in general. So, something that says something about who you are, um, which is where we kind of start crossing over into verifiable credentials. And again, we're kind of purely looking at definitions here and not like where things are happening from a technical perspective and how that's going on, which we'll come on to in a, in a bit later. So, if we then look at, at kind of verifiable credentials and within the bracket of credentials. Um, so leaning on the W3C definition, um, you've got uh, credentials kind of being described as a set of one or more claims made by an issuer, then expanding that into verifiable. So a tamper evident credential that has authorship that can be cryptographically verified. So this isn't that the data itself has been verified against the correct source. It's that the uh, recipient of that credential can know that it came from a specific issuer and that it relates to a specific subject and hasn't been tampered on the journey through um, and obviously kind of if we relate that back to the, the wording of claims um, those can be kind of individual attributes or statements about a, a subject um, where a credential is making up a, a kind of um, a group of claims now if we then kind of take this as given and move on to, um, if we kind of take these as the, as the definitions, you've obviously got kind of NFTs very much focused uh, initially on assets. Um, and then because of the ease of development, the ease of working with them, they started being used for identity um, to represent kind of credentials, to represent people. Um, and obviously one of the challenges there is, is doing that on Ledger, which we'll, we'll kind of come back to. And then the kind of the, the reaction to that was um, kind of soul bound tokens, the idea of representing um, kind of commitments, credentials, affiliations, all on ledger um, and doing that in relation to subjects or people or um, ultimately in kind of any organization. Um, and then completely separately, we had obviously a verifiable credential, which um, the first two obviously came out of the more like crypto, DeFi, Web3 kind of space, whereas ver verifiable credentials came out more, a lot more from uh, the self-sovereign ID, self-managed Web5 kind of space, obviously Web5 being the, and self-managed being kind of the most recent terms, but basically that community that's been kind of working away on its own um, for, for quite a number of years now. So we've, we've kind of got these, these two kind of groups um, that have each come out with its own kind of um, implementations. Um, and now we can move more into kind of where the similarities are and where the differences are and, and how you might use one or the other. Again, not discussing whether it's right or wrong. So um, a while back, I produced this flowchart, which we'll get onto in a second, but we'll just land here whilst we talk about kind of similarities. So um, the, the majority or really that where the similarities are is that um, most of these, I guess, concepts um, have been proposed rightly, or, pro, pro, sorry, proposed or used rightly or wrongly as solutions for identity, um, whether that's self-sovereign ID, decentralized ID, um, or just in general data relating to, to kind of a subject. And again, it kind of relates back to NFTs were very focused on assets, but then people started using them for identity, again, rightly or wrongly. The response for that was actually, let's move this into soul bound. So they're now NFTs with specific properties. Um, so they are maybe related to, like I was saying, um, commitments, credentials, affiliations, but also maybe they're non-transferable. So this is an NFT that can be issued to someone, but then they can't transfer it any further because it's intrinsic to that person. And therefore you can't obviously transfer something that's intrinsic to you to another person. Um, so this may be something like a birth certificate, potentially. Again, not debating rightly or wrongly whether that should go on ledger and under the kind of bracket of that. Um, but then you're um, otherwise, and, and this, we've kind of already started to cover this, but the, the similarities are mainly between kind of NFTs and soulbound tokens. Um, and the reason for this is effectively um, soulbound tokens are almost an implementation or very specific implementation of non-fungible non tokens. Um, they have kind of evolved from the same 
uh, standards that NFTs were originally created from, so uh, EI, EIP 71, um, and then shifted through into kind of more iterations where they have specific properties like kind of the inability to transfer. Um, VCs are almost entirely separate. Um, so whilst there's kind of data models that sit under each, each of these, really from a similarity perspective, the similarities are between the class that has, or the class of kind of SBTs and NFTs that have been built within the crypto web three communities and then kind of VCs sat on their own. Um, and that's, that's really where the kind of the similarities end. And so it's much more interesting to start diving into kind of the differences and where you may may use one over the other. Um, so the if we kind of start at the top, we've we've kind of been looking um, if we take a gener uh, a generic term record to start agnostically covering like NFTs, Solban tokens and VCs in general, if we just take that kind of record as an idea. And obviously this this record can represent theoretically anything. It could be an asset, it could be a statement about an individual, and therefore there's kind of um, very, very different kind of flows. So if we look in this flowchart down to where we actually want to get to, um, what we've con or what I've considered here is kind of non-fungible tokens, private non-fungible tokens, so obviously non-fungible tokens in their standard form are typically public, anyone can see them. Uh, private NFTs are an NFT where it's only uh, public if so desired, um, so it's kind of default private but can be revealed. And then you're through into kind of across way on the right hand side is soulbound tokens. And in the kind of more of the middle we've got uh, verifiable credentials, um, so yeah, uh, VCs. And then a specifically, specifically called out revocable VCs um, for, for a good reason. Um, and the idea here behind a revocable VC is it's a credential that can be issued that then after the fact can then be revoked. So even though the individual has a copy of that data which has signatures on it, can be verified, actually when the recipient receives that credential, um, it, it, they can see that it's revoked and therefore can't be taken forwards. So um, if we start at the top, the easiest way, and hopefully this is not too small, the easiest way of kind of zooming into this, and I wonder if this will work. There we go, slightly better. Um, the um, easiest way to start really is whether this is an asset or not. If we kind of return to where NFTs originally came from, it was all around representing ideally kind of unique assets on Ledger. Um, so that's one of the easiest ways to kind of to kind of flow this down. Um, if we kind of pass down this this left hand side, one of the easiest ways of testing whether this is an asset and therefore it kind of fits inside this class is whether it is transferable or tradable. So transferable just meaning you could go and give it to anyone else. And obviously tradable involving like that, that process involving some kind of monetary trade or value trade. Um, so if it is a yes, then it's, it's quite neatly flowing down this path. And then we're into whether that ownership needs to be public or private. And that quite neatly takes us into kind of non-fungible tokens or into kind of private non-fungible tokens. Now, where this gets more interesting is obviously um, if that asset isn't uh, transferable or tradable, typically that wouldn't be an asset. Like if, if it's an asset which can never be moved on, actually it probably fits more into the other classes that, that we're about to, tr about to talk about. Now, the other easy side of this is kind of going down the, it's, it's definitely not an asset. So if we're going down this, uh, this path where it's like definitely not an asset, um, then we can start going into like, should that record be public or not? Um, so this could be, again, we'll come back to proper examples later on, but this could be something like being on the uh, voting register inside the UK, um, or it could be a, f a fair trade mark. Again, we'll come back to this in a second. So obviously, if you if the default for that should be public, um, and that's probably where this, this needs some nuance, if the default for that credential should be public, that may be something where a Solbound token makes sense to, to have. Um, because it has that default pro public mode. Now, if the default should be private, then we're likely looking at a verifiable credential where the privacy model is that 
um, information is by default private unless someone wants to kind of publicize that. And again, uh, probably one of the nuances here is VCs are always talked about as, as kind of privacy preserving and that's accurate. Um, but you can kind of make those endlessly public if you so wished, still with the ability to pull that data back um, later on. Now, where this gets mis um, kind of messy in, in the middle is kind of where our examples later on will start testing out. So obviously, if you're not sure whether it's an asset or a record, we can start to kind of look at the different um, features that, or the features required or behaviors required and start to kind of drive those down. So um, if the asset's transferable or traceable with or without the creator or issuer, and what this really is driving at is if the issuer of that data is always involved, then actually we may be able to kind of look at credentials over non-fungible tokens. One of the benefits of NFTs is that an individual who receives one, as long as it's not a sub-bound token and not tradable, can effectively pass that on. And it's why there's been, or there was such a huge boom in um, NFT marketplaces um, kind of earlier this year. Obviously, if that can, uh, if that kind of asset or record can only be kind of transferred with the permission or with the involvement of the issuer, actually you're probably looking more into something like a credential which can be kind of revoked, taken back, issued elsewhere. Um, again, if we're kind of looking into this, um, yeah, if, if it needs the creator, you're kind of into this path. And then also you're, you're kind of into um, kind of almost market dynamics. So um, if you're looking at a record um, as it kind of flows down um, and whether uh, if you're looking at that record you also need to start considering like does that record need to be scarce does there need to be a record somewhere that this is unique um, and this is where things start to get really really interesting so um, does the record represent something unique and we'll come back to this in, in some of the examples that really flesh this out um, and that's where kind of the split between say um, revocation or kind of VCs can start to come in. So if we're looking at scarcity of whatever that record is and it doesn't need to be scarce and the issue or creator is always involved in any transfer, actually the the kind of easiest way to think about this is, is actually as a as a VC, as a, as a verifiable credential. Um, if the if the asset instead does need to be scarce um, and that scarceness must be public, um, that's where we can kind of like flow this down even further. So if we kind of say yes, is the asset unique and where scarceness must be public, if we say no, actually the, this needs to be scarce, but it doesn't necessarily need to be public, that's where kind of the revocable NFT can, sorry, revocable VC can come in. So this is where actually that can kind of flow down into um, yeah, this can flow down into into um, a verifiable credential, um, but it needs to be revocable because we need that scarcity. We can't have kind of copies of the same credential moving around. Like it needs to be kind of one is kill uh, to almost avoid the double spend problem, but in a kind of credential model. And obviously, if you if you do need that uniqueness, you do need it to be public. Um, that's that's kind of where you're going down the the SBT route again. Now, um, if we kind of start taking taking examples, this is where things get a lot more interesting. So um, the easiest from an asset perspective is something like a house. Um, so an ex like a, an exact house, is it's unique, can be sold, um, and especially without the uh, involvement of the creator, so the builder. Um, we'll leave like the debate around fra fractionalized ownership for, for another time. Um, but effectively, kind of the, the the house really nicely flows down. Kind of, um, yes, it's it's an asset. Um, it's it's freely transferable and tradable, and therefore, actually, it, it can kind of pass down into an NFT quite neatly. And that's why there's like a propagation of lots of projects going out and doing this. And obviously, if if that didn't need to be public, actually, that could be private. So um, obviously, there's kind of homeowner registries, that kind of thing. So there's a debate there. But ultimately, it really nicely fits down that kind of NFT, NFT path. And it's why there's been such a, yeah, a propagation of adoption of, of or kind of proper, proper propagation of projects kind of going down that path. 
Um, if we then take the offset route, so if we look at, say, a certification for a company, so a really good example here would be like fair trade for coffee or for kind of cocoa. Um, actually, that doesn't rep it doesn't represent an asset at all, although you could argue it has it has value. Um, but the record should be public. It's kind of on every single um, on their on company's website. It's on all the products they make, and actually they they'd want that record to be public. Now, that's quite nice in the it doesn't it's not an asset. Um, and it needs to be public. It's something that by default needs to be out there in the world. Um, and therefore, kind of that's where maybe an SVT does make sense, um, even though ideally you'd want this to be public and revocable. Um, where things get a lot more interesting is where we go into things like ticketing. Now, obviously, traditionally, tickets, sorry, tickets have a finite number. Um, they may be unique. Um, in tying to a specific seat um, and sometimes they're tied to an individual identity. Um, so a great example of this would be tickets like Glastonbury where those tickets are extremely tightly tied to a single individual's identity. Um, it's not possible to sell that ticket on without the involvement of, of the issuer, in this case the festival. Um, and so in this case kind of it's debatable of whether you're issuing an asset or, or kind of not, um, but it's not kind of transferable or, or yeah, transferable or, or, tran or tradable um, without the involvement of the issuer. So we're down into kind of um, are they involved, which they are, um, and then we're into that scarcity. So in, in this in this scenario, obviously, Glastonbury knows exactly how many tickets they're issued. They don't need this to be public, and therefore we're arguably into something like a, a credential where it's issued to someone specifically. And if they do need to um, make this, um, if they do need to, to kind of uh, make sure this is um, there's still transferability or tradability, whilst maintaining um, kind of controls and making sure that there's not this kind of double spend problem, that's maybe where they're into kind of a revocable verifiable credential where if one individual wants to sell their ticket or return it, therefore they can, that ticket's revoked and it kind of goes out in, in somewhere else. Now, um, a counter example would be uh, tickets where they're really not tied to an identity. It's almost like that piece of paper that you just need to, sh or kind of um, PDF, that you just need to show up with. Um, and that's where kind of that can be passed on ad infinitum like all the way to the end. Um, and it doesn't have the involvement of, of kind of the original issuer. And that's obviously where most of the market is right now in terms of like resale, um, resale sites um, and, and kind of all that jazz. So in, in this situation, you've obviously got, not sure of whether it's an asset or a record, it is tradable or tran uh, kind of uh, yeah transferable or, or tradable without the creator or the issuer. Then we flow down into does the asset or ownership need to be public? Um, and obviously, uh, kind of this is where there's debate of like whether that's uh, public NFT or a private NFT. But ultimately, it's something that needs to be transferable without the involvement of the original issuer. At which point, this kind of maybe flows down the the NFT route. And so if we if we kind of look at these two models, actually, as long as the um, kind of um, ticket doesn't have a, a strong tie to an identity and can be kind of freely traded, you're, you're kind of looking at maybe an NFT model. But actually, over time, if we start kind of tying these to identity in the way that Glastonbury and arguably other other artists, uh, sorry, and arguably artists are starting to, where they are trying to eliminate their secondary markets, eliminate scalping and sniping, actually are shifting a lot further across into the verifiable credential model. So there's um, a lot of room for debate, um, and it's it's we're only kind of just over twenty minutes in. Um, but effectively, you've, you've got these kind of three, I guess, primitives. Um, arguably, SBTs fit inside NFTs as a primitive. But if you kind of flow this down, um, effectively, there's, there's kind of three primitives available. They each have their pros and cons, mostly to do with kind of the default privacy model and what that means for individuals. Um, but also, we're then looking into kind of 
whether those items or those primitives are kind of transferable or tradable without the involvement of the original creator, um, but also whether that needs to be, again, needs to be public um, and needs to be kind of have uniqueness um, kind of visible into the market. Um, so without further ado, I'll just kind of return to um, kind of our, our contact slide. Um, hopefully you will have found that helpful um, and like myself and the team are here for any questions you may have on this or checked or trusted data ecosystems and uh, the kind of the models that we're building out. So thank you for your time and hope you find it helpful.